this morning, but I want to share with you a couple of interesting things just in general, how everything in Scripture points towards God's work and towards the Messiah, towards Jesus. And uh, I did an interesting exercise um, this week, and I went and I looked at the first five books of the Bible, right? also known as the Torah or the instructions. The word Torah actually is not law, it's the word for instruction. All right, and so God gave the Hebrews his instructions. And you know what I found? A couple of interesting things. If we look at the focus area of the first five books of the Bible, um, you'll discover something very fascinating. Now, the thing is, um, why do I share that this morning? Remember last week we looked at the Feast of Tabernacles, and I said to you, all the elements that are pointing towards Jesus in the feast. It's so relevant, you know. And they had the various practices. You remember I said that a number of Jesus' quotes, or the things, statements that he made when he was on earth, actually is referencing the biblical feasts. And the thing is, if you don't understand the feasts, and you don't have a knowledge about them, you're going to struggle to understand some of the things that Jesus said. For example, when he said, um, I am the living water. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. That was said during the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. Because what was the practice in biblical times? Remember I told you and I showed you the photos of that or the reconstruction where they would take wine um, in the temple area and they will take um, uh, water which they gather down at the, at the springs. And as they came up with the water and the wine, they would pour it out you know, up in the temple and it will mix together and they would pray for rain, physical rain, but they will also pray for spiritual rain. Now it's in this context when this ceremony took place where they were praying for rain and say, God, bless us not only with physical rain for the new coming time because we need to plant and we need to, you know, do our crops and all of that, but bless us with the spiritual rain to feed us spiritually as well. That's the symbol, symbolism of the wine. And it's in that context that Jesus came and he said, if anyone is thirsty, come to me. In other words, I am the fulfillment of this prayer that you're praying now. If you want this living water, if you want this fulfillment to be spiritually renewed, I am the one that's giving it. Now the thing is, if you don't know about this practice and what it symbolizes, you won't know what Jesus was actually saying. You miss so much of that. All right. So we looked at a lot of the symbolism and um, what the, all the various things of the feast point towards the Lord. And I thought as we look at this feast, I want to lay a, a quick foundation as we look at other topics that also point towards the Lord. And then I'll focus more on the feast and a component of that. But if you look at the first five books of the Bible, it's very interesting. Because we know that um, the Lord gave the feasts in that context, and they are all blueprints or rehearsals. Remember, we looked at that last week. God said, I want you every year to have these feasts as a rehearsal for the real thing to come. In other words, it points towards something bigger than themselves that's going to take place in the future. And that's why God says, every year, I want you to start with Passover, and you go through all seven of the feasts, and the last feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, where we are now, in the middle of it, actually, today. Um, this feast is a, um, it, it gives us a picture of the whole salvation purpose of God. How God planned to save humanity because of what happened of man's rebellion in the garden when we sinned against them, Adam and Eve, you know, the source of humanity, or the first two. And so God, from the beginning, planned to save us and to bring us back to that relationship with Him. Because God is a relational God. He's not someone that's from a distance, you know, up there, Betty Midler, remember that one? All right. God is not from a distance watching us. You know, Jesus said to His disciples, I will never leave you, never forsake you. I'm with you every moment, you know. So much so that He knows even the hairs that fall from your head. I mean, he knows you better than your husband knows you, or your wife knows you, or you know your children, or you know yourself. And um, that's the beauty of that, because God is relational. And the feasts is all about God's focus on relationship. Now take a look at this. If, we, if you take the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and you take those books and you look at 
the main focus areas of those five books. Like say, what's the main focus area of Genesis? What's the main theme? And what? Okay, that's the first one. That's a good one. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. <laughs> it's always good to start at the beginning, Erna. But I'm going to actually ask you, so that you, you're ahead of time, you know. It's that prophetic heart that's coming out, you know. <laughs> so what, what happened is that um, if I say, what's the central theme of Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus? And we look at the names of those books in Hebrew. It's, there's a very interesting message that we find there. And I want to I just show you that for a moment before we continue. The focus of the first five books. What would you say is Genesis all about? If I would say, take the book of Genesis, give me the main focus areas. Erna said creation. Give me some other areas. In the beginnings, okay, it's the book about beginnings, all right, very good. Family. family focus, very strong on family. Abraham, we see the whole story of God calling Abraham of Ur of the Chaldeans, and he called him out with Lot. Very strong family focus. What else? The Exodus, it comes, yeah, well, yes, it's, it's preparing the way for the Exodus to come. And it's lining up the story for that. Okay, Let me show you a quick summary. Genesis covers creation, the patriarchs, Abram, Isaac, Jacob. You know the stories around them. And the beginning of Israel, focusing on God's covenant with humanity. In Hebrew, all right, now this is very important. Genesis is called Bereshit, all right, in Hebrew. And it means in the beginning. It is all about the beginning of creation and the beginning of God's process to establish relationships and covenants with His people. So the book of Genesis is not just the beginning of creation. It's all about the beginning of the process to establish long-lasting covenants and relationship with His people. And that's why He called Abraham. All right. So we have the story in the beginning, you know, um, no, uh, um, Adam and Eve, and then, you know, Cain and Abel, and then God gave them Seth because Cain killed Abel. And then you have the generations running up to the flood of Noah, and then after the flood. And then you see God beginning to engage with people in a very strong way by calling Abraham. All right. So that's Genesis. So please remember, Bereshit, which means in the beginnings. Be, if you have Be in Hebrew in front of a word, it means in. All right. If I say I'm going into the hotel, Bermalon, into the hotel, or Bereshit, it's in the beginnings. All right. Now let's look at Exodus. What would you say is the main focus of Exodus? Obviously, the Exodus. All right. Just don't say that. Give me something else. Deliverance. Deliverance. Very strong focus. What else? Tabernacles. Tabernacles. Okay. Good. All right. Let me give you an executive quick summary. Exodus tells the story of Israel's slavery in Egypt, their liberation, and the establishment of God's laws, redemption, and covenant. In Hebrew, Exodus, Exodus is called Shemot, all right? And it means names. So we call it Exodus. And for us, immediately it's connecting with the Exodus of Moses. But actually in Hebrew, the name of the book is Names. And you might think, why? What's going on there? I'll explain now. God called His people by name, and He identified them by name to liberate them. In the Hebrew, it's a bit different. For us, we just focus on the process of going out of Egypt. For the Hebrews, it's like, whoa, we are called by name. In other words, again, it focuses on the relationship component. God doesn't just say, okay, everyone who wants to, I call you by name. That's why the name of Exodus is... Shemot or names. Okay? What would you say? The next one, Leviticus. And now it's getting more difficult, huh? Priesthood. Priesthood? Very good one. What else? Leviticus. Offering. Offerings. All right. Health. Health. It's all got to do with the, the dietary laws and things like that. All right. And we find a lot of the ceremonial laws and the moral laws. Leviticus centers on instructions, rituals, and priestly duties, emphasizing holiness and the proper worship of God. Leviticus in Hebrew, Vayakra, means, and he called. Think about that. If I say to you this morning, turn to the book of Leviticus, I would say to you, turn to the book of, and he called. If I had to directly translate it from, from Hebrew. 
God invites them to holiness by showing the Hebrews the rituals and the priestly duties. So there's a lot of instructions that he gives to Aaron and his descendants on that. And what Israel must do in terms of the offerings and the sacrifices, etc. Why? Because he wants them to be a unique and different people. Not like all the other pagan nations, worshipping the Baals and the Astros and all the pagan gods. He wanted uniqueness with them. Why? Because he wants relationship. Alright? There's, there's reason why God gave them everything. Because it all goes back to pointing to Christ, pointing to something bigger, and the relationship component that He wants with His people. Then we get to the book of Numbers. Now, who want to guess that? Census. Census. Alright, good one. What else? The further we go, the more quiet everyone becomes. It can show you over the years which books people have read the most, you know, and which sermons have been preached on the most in churches. You know, Exodus is easy, all right? Okay, that's a good one. All right, you're disqualified, Erna. I, I get you, you read that a lot. Yeah, I'm just joking, you can really answer. All right, let me give it to you. Numbers. Numbers de details the Israelites' journey in the wilderness, their struggles, and census data. Focusing on God's guidance and judgment. Numbers in Hebrew is Bemidbar. Bemidbar. Alright? Meaning in the wilderness. God led and guided them through the wilderness journey to the promised land. So the, the, the book of Numbers is literally called in the wilderness. Again, Bemidbar. Remember? Be, and what's the word for desert? Midbar. Remember, we looked at that. And remember that sermon that I gave that sometimes when you're in a desert, God speaks to you? Because in Hebrew, the word davar, for the word word, you know, the word that you speak, and midbar, it's got the same root. Alright? If I say, ani metaber, I speak. Alright? Metaber, it's linked to the whole concept of word, davar, and also desert. Okay? In the midbar. So, that's what that is all about. And then the last one is, of course, the book of Deuteronomy. Take a guess. What does Deuteronomy deal with? Blessings and curses. Okay. Blessings, curses. What else? Summary of Moses. Summary of? Moses of the Torah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. That's, that's uh, to a large part what it's about. Deuteronomy presents Moses' speeches, rendering the law and the covenants before entering or is re reiterating the law and the covenants before they enter the promised land, emphasizing obedience and faithfulness. Deuteronomy in Hebrew is devarim, meaning words. Davar, midbar, I just said it. All right. So it's very interesting. If you go and look at the first five books of the Bible, each of the first five books of the Bible highlights a relationship between God and His people through covenant and law and instructions. Right. So if we have to summarize it, remember Genesis, Bereshit, in the beginning, Shmot, Exodus, which is names, then you have Vayakra, which is Leviticus, and he called. Numbers is Bemidbar, in the desert, of course, in the wilderness, and Devarim, words or speeches. Now you think, okay, so what's so interesting about that? Remember, I said in the beginning, everything points to God's purpose and His, pur and His plan of salvation and of what He's going to do through the Messiah, through Jesus. If you had to take or compile a sentence that complements the focus areas of the first five books of the Bible, including the meaning of the names, in the beginning, names He called in the wilderness, words or speeches. If you had to reconstruct that, and I did it this week, just an interesting exercise. And say, if we have to put the first five books of the Bible into a sentence, what would that sentence be? Considering the main theme of each book and considering the meaning of each name of the book. All right? Look at this. In the beginning, Bereshit, God calls his people by name, Shemot, into or God calls them by name, invites them to holiness, Vayikha, guides them through the wilderness, Bemidbar, and speak His words, Devarim, to prepare them for the promised land. Isn't that incredible? 
It's the whole process that God walked with the Hebrews to get them to the promised land are just in the names of the first five books of the Bible if you look at their meaning. Because that's what God is doing. And the thing is, what's interesting, God is not, He didn't just do this with the Hebrews, He is doing this process with us. Because what we see in the Old Testament, and you read about that in the New Testament, that a lot of the things in, in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says, what the Hebrews went through are lessons for us. Their wilderness journey, the times where they were disobedience, God had to punish them, etc. They are lessons in us, for us, in those events that took place. Now, I've shared about this before, and I want to reiterate that. And that is that, do you know that there is a second exodus coming? We, sometimes when we speak about the exodus, we only look at what happened in the book of Exodus, where God took them out of Egypt to the promised land. But if you go and read the Bible, and you go and read, for example, what's it, Jeremiah 23, and you read other passages of scriptures, it makes it very clear. And Paul has got this as an underlying tone in his theological mindset as he writes his letters to the churches. And that is that God is going to take his people home again to a, another promised land that is eternal. Do you know that what Israel went through, Exodus going out of Egypt, is a prophetic picture. It's a small event of something much bigger that's going to happen, that's going to take place. When God takes all of us to the promised land, all those that call upon the name of the Lord um, will be saved. And those that call upon the name of Jesus will one day be taken to the promised land, which is a person, not even a place. It's Jesus Himself. If you read in the Bible about the tree of life, we read about it in Genesis, we read about it right through the Bible, right to the book of um, uh, Revelation. The, the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Now if you read about that, do you know that the tree of life is pointing, it's an arrow pointing to something else? And that's God Himself. Because He is the one that brings healing to the nations. And you find that everywhere in the Bible, you have these hints towards the tree of life that brings healing. For example, remember when they walked through the Red Sea and they came to the other side and they sang the song of Moses? Remember they got to a place and they found water. What was wrong with the water? It was bitter. What was the place called? Mara. Very good. All right. It was called Mara. So what did Moses do to fix it? What did God say to him? Take a tree, there was a tree, cut it, throw it into the water and it will make the bitter waters sweet. You constantly have these things of trees and bringing healing to bitterness because that's what Jesus does to us. All right? Because He is the tree of life. And so you see right in the beginning even in the Garden of Eden, before the fall, you have these arrows pointing towards Jesus. Throughout the story of the Hebrews, you find these arrows. The priestly order with what they had to wear and all the clothes and the garments, it's all arrows pointing towards Jesus. And maybe one day we'll do that. I don't know if, you've, if you're aware of this, but you know that the entire salvation message of what Jesus came to do is in the clothes of the high priest. Everything is there. The, the ordinances that they had to go through, the type of offerings that they had to bring, everything are arrows pointing towards Jesus that fulfills every single thing. And so you can see even the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, it's all about a person at the end of the day. And he's longing to live in covenant relationship with us. All right. Now, there's a second exodus that is coming. And the Feast of Tabernacles are very much focused upon this reality. Because remember, I showed you right in the beginning that uh, last week, in the beginning of the session, we, have, we start with Passover, and then we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then you had the Feast of First Fruits, and then you had 50 days, and then you have Pentecost with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Those first four feasts mainly has been fulfilled in His first coming. And then you have the last 
three feasts, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles. Day of Atonement, of course, when the great high priest went into the Holy of Holies. All right? He didn't only went in once, he went in a couple of times, but it only happened on that one day. All right? And then, of course, you have the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's a beautiful picture. Passover starts with Jesus' redemptive purpose. Tabernacles ends with it. Seven feasts fulfilled within seven months of each other, all of them pointing towards the process. So if you look at Passover, Jesus died. He was buried. Feast of unleavened bread. Three days later, he rose to life. Feast of first fruits. He was the first fruit of the dead. All right? Have you ever thought about this? Why does Jesus call the first fruit of the dead? If there were many people before him that was raised from the dead, Elijah raised people from the dead. Think about that. Jesus was not the first person raised from the dead. Why does the Bible say he's the first fruits of the dead? Any takers? Yes, David. He will not die again. Exactly. He received a glorified body. We know that the New Testament says that one day we will be like him. All right? So Jesus is the first one who rose in that glorified state that we will be in one day. He will not die again. All the others, Lazarus died again. All right? Think about that. He was raised to life and he died. All the others um, that we read about, even Old New Testament, they all died. But Jesus was the first fruits that's got the glorified body and he will never die again you know as we will be one day with him and so we see this whole process and then 50 days later pentecost the holy spirit was poured out and then there's a couple of months break and then you have the last three feasts trumpets atonement and tabernacles and they still need to be fulfilled so what we're doing when you look at those feasts especially the last one where we are today in the feast of tabernacles it's looking forward at something that is to come and God wants us to rejoice because that's what this feast is about. It's about a great rejoicing. It's about what is to come. Because we see by faith the things that are coming that are not yet as if they are. And we rejoice in that. And God says that is great because it anchors us in our eternal future and destiny with Him. And so if you talk about the greater Exodus, when Jesus comes again as the greater Moses, he will lead us from this world of slavery and death into the promised land. We will be with him, the new Jerusalem. We will be with him forever. All right. Now let me give you a couple of um, examples of, or Rod, let me just first say, why is it important that we should study the biblical feasts? And then I'm going to give you some examples. Because God communicates truth to us through the feasts, especially what he has done and what he is he's about to do. Another reason is they help us to understand God's timing and His actions much better. When was Jesus crucified? Exactly in Passover on the day that they made the sacrifices. When did He raise back to life? Exactly on the Feast of First Fruits. Can you see that God fulfills the feast exactly in the feast? Which means that the last three feasts where Jesus will return... And if you look at the Feast of Tabernacles of that, it will happen in the second half of the year, in this time. Because He fulfills it in the time. That we don't know which day and which time, but it will be fulfilled in the second half of the year. All right? Then it is important to understand the Bible better because a lot of the biblical writers quote and reference these feasts. And then lastly, it reveals to us the patterns that God following in fulfilling His purposes. Now, let's look at the, at the, um, the Exodus, the first one. You know the plagues that God struck the Egyptians with. And again, a lot of you know this because I say this over and over. But those plagues were not just random plagues. They were all guided against Egyptian deities. So in other words, these were all gods that they, the Egyptians worship, that they believe the spirit of those gods are behind the animals. And so they worshipped it. So it's a showdown of power. God literally went in a showdown of power with the Egyptians' gods. And he says, okay, let's take this god. I'll show you I'm more powerful than this one. And he showed himself more powerful. And then the next one. And then the next one. And the next one. And lastly was Pharaoh, because Pharaoh was considered as a god. For those of you who don't know, is that Pharaoh in the morning did a ritual called the ritual of the rising of the morning sun. 
And they literally believe that Pharaoh was partly responsible for the rising of the sun in the morning. And he was the, the connection point, a point of contact between the cosmic gods and earth. So he was worshipped. And it's interesting that God went and lastly, what did he do? He killed the Pharaoh's son. Why not Pharaoh? Why not the Pharaoh? Why did he kill the firstborn? Because he, he, God stopped the succession of the pharaohs through that. Because if he killed the pharaoh, his firstborn son would have just become pharaoh again and it would have continued. So by taking the son, when the pharaoh dies, it stops. It's a, it's a more, much more severe judgment that God gave them. All right? So, let's quickly look at some of the prophetic patterns. And what I want to show you is that a lot of what we see in the Bible is an arrow pointing towards the greater exodus that is coming. That the whole story, as important as it is, of the Hebrews going out of Egypt to the promised land, is prophetic in nature, pointing towards something greater that's going to come when God takes all the people out of sin and slavery of this world into the promised land. Let me show you biblical references and a number of examples of this. There's a lot I don't have time to do all of them, so I'm just going to do a couple of them. All right, I'm going to jump through that. And here we go. Number one, deliverer from bondage. Moses delivered Israel from slavery in Egypt, while Jesus at his second coming will deliver his people from bondage of sin and the corrupted world system that we are in. Can you see? It's the same thing. Both are deliverers. Deliverers from Egypt under the control of Pharaoh, which is symbolic of Satan, and the new one where God takes us to the, to the promised land. All right? Look at that. Both of them were mediators of a covenant. Moses mediated the old covenant between God and Israel. That's Exodus 19. While Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant, fulfilling the law and bringing final redemption. That's Hebrews chapter 9. Both of them were mediators. Look at the next one. Very interesting. Both of them had supernatural signs. Moses performed signs and wonders to authenticate his mission. Similarly, Jesus' second coming is accompanied by cosmic size, signs and wonders. Before Jesus comes to lead us out, what do we read in Revelation about the judgments? Trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments. And they are astonishingly similar to the Judgment that we find in the book of, of Exodus. Alright, look at the next one. Both of Moses confronted gods, and so will Jesus. Moses confronted the false gods of Egypt, Exodus 12. Jesus will confront and destroy all the false worship, including the beast and the false prophet. It's in the book of Revelation. Same pattern. Let's look at the next pattern. Rebellion against leadership. During the wilderness journey, some Israelites rebelled against Moses' leadership. In the end times, again, we see a rebellion of people against Christ. We read about the great apostasy that's going to take place. Same patterns. Look at this pattern. Pharaoh and Satan. Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, enslaved the Israelites and resisted God's will. In Revelation, Satan plays a similar role, oppressing the saints and resisting Christ's rule. Exactly the same pattern. Look at the next one. Opposition by sorcery. This is interesting. Pharaoh's magicians opposed Moses with sorcery. What do we read about in the book of Revelation? What will the Antichrist and the false prophet do? The beast and the false prophet use signs and wonders to deceive. It's the same thing. Isn't it interesting? Here you had Pharaoh. He had his magicians and they performed false things. Here you have Satan in the last days before Jesus came and he had the He's got the false prophet and the antichrist and they perform the same type of false miracles. It's a repeat. Look at the next one. Mountains of Revelation. God revealed himself on Mount Sinai through Moses or to Moses. In Revelation, Jesus reveals himself on, himself on Mount Zion to his redeemed people. Both of them on a mountain with covenants. All right. Look at the next one. The new song of redemption. After the Red Sea crossing... Moses and the Israelites sang a song of victory. In the book of Revelation, the redeemed sing a new song of victory to the Lamb. And what is it called in the book of Revelation? The song of Moses. It's a repeat. All right? 
Look at eternal rest. Moses led the people to rest in the promised land. Deuteronomy 12. Though he did not enter it himself, Jesus, through his second coming, leads the people to eternal rest in the new Jerusalem. Revelation 21, Hebrews 4. Can you see? Both deliverers were taking the people to a place of rest. Moses' rest is temporary. Jesus' rest is eternal. All right? Very, very interesting. So what do we see all of this? And there are numerous examples like this. I'm telling you, the list just goes on and on and on. Of when you read the story of the Exodus, you find that all the events are arrows pointing to a bigger one that's coming. Now, why is that important to know? It's because it shows us that God knows the end from the beginning. That this Bible that we're reading, that people are arguing about, or is it the Word of God, is it not? If you cannot see, if you really study the Scriptures, it's because people have never really studied the Scriptures. That's why they think it's not God's Word. If you really study it in detail, and you begin to look at all these connection points and dots, and it's like, how is it possible that these things can, can co that they can repeat in such precision time after time after time again. You go through the prophets, you go through the writings of the Psalms. It's just like, how is this possible that these links are there constantly, consistently? And it just works out every time. Every calculation works out. People that argue scriptures never really studied that. And that includes some theologians. Because there are numerous theologians and biblical scholars that in studying the Bible or reading it, apparently, you know, sometimes they come to the place of, is it really God's word? Oh, you know, it might not be God's word because this and this and this. It's because they don't get what the Bible is trying to say. Remember when we look at those statistics, and I'll begin to close with this. Remember when we look at the statistics, if you take eight of Jesus' prophecies fulfilled in his life, where he would be born, what he would do, you know, that a friend will, just, that will betray him for 30 pieces of silver, and um, that this friend will be someone that was, you know, close to him, that his clothes will not be div um, torn, but it will be divided amongst the people, that he would die on a cross, born in Bethlehem. That whole story, if you just take eight prophecies of Jesus, what's the chance that eight prophecies can be fulfilled by one man in his lifetime in chronological order as it is prophesied? Ten to the power of, can you remember? If you take 84, it's something like ten to the power of 137 or something like that. 84 prophecies. We don't have math that goes that, that go that high. There's not enough atoms apparently in the universe. It's more than the number of atoms in the universe. No universe. It's like if you begin to look at the statistics and you really break it apart and you look at at fr from that perspective that Jesus fulfilled over three hundred and twenty-four prophecies on the day and hour that it was prophesied sometimes two, three thousand years before he came. What's the chance of that? And then people doubt the text. Look at this. From the beginning, God has already revealed the end to us. The Exodus story is a prophetic event showing all of us what the end will be like. God reveals on a small scale the Exodus story what will one day occur on a large scale. And that's what we read, for example, in Isaiah 46. Look at this beautiful verse. It says, Remember what happened long ago, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I declare the end from the beginning, and ancient times from what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and all my good pleasures I will accomplish. Can you see that right from the beginning, God showed us the end. And if you read the Bible, and you cannot see that the Bible was written and put together by something or someone, in our context, God, that stands outside of our dimension of space-time, that's not bound by time, that's not bound by location, 
then you have not read the scriptures. Because if you begin to see that in time events, what God is going to do, He already declared three, four, five thousand years before those events happen. And then we go through the natural course of human history and God fulfills every single thing up to the letter. You know there's over a thousand two hundred prophecies in the Bible that's been fulfilled? A thousand two hundred? There are some that still needs to be fulfilled pertaining to the end times and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the majority of the rest has been fulfilled. They are still some outstanding. But you go and look where they were fulfilled, by who? It's exactly as prophesied. Because God can see the end right from the beginning. And I'll close with this analogy because this is what it's like. All right? It's like when you stand, and some of you might remember this because I've shared this before. If you are standing and you are looking at a, what do you call it, when people dress up and they do flots, you know, and they like a, a what? No, man, it's like if you stand next to the road and there are people coming past and there's the bands and the... You call it a, a parade, that's the word. All right. Sorry. <laughs> How difficult can this be? All right. A parade. Okay. So, so if you stand next to a parade, all right, and we're standing, and you're standing next to it, and you see, oh, here are the clowns coming, or whatever it may be, and they're doing this. And then you see there's a flood. Oh, there's something. And you see there's uh, some kind of a figure that was made there, a big teddy bear or something, and, you know, music. And here comes the band. And, what, and you stand there, and it takes you an hour for this parade to come through. Very big parade. Thousands of people next to the road. And you're standing your shoulder on shoulder, and this parade comes through. It takes you an hour to see everything that's in this parade. All right? So if someone tells you, hey, what are you seeing? You see, like, I'm, I'm seeing a flot in front of me and there's a big teddy bear on it. But someone that's like 50 meters towards your left hand side might say, no, that's not what is in front of me. I'm seeing, you know, there's a band in front of me, a brass band. And that's very often when we, we talk about the scriptures, you know, people see different things, but they're seeing the same thing from different angles. And so a guy... 50 meters down, we'll still see something else. But the fact of the matter is, it's going to take an hour for everyone in that, you know, next to the road to see what is in the parade. Now, if there's someone else that gets in a bill that's in one of the high rises next to the road, and they are on the 20th story of this building, and they look down and they can see the entire hour in one glance. Because they've got a different perspective on the parade. So that person sitting on the 20th floor can say, oh, there's a brass band and then there's this and there's a flot with this and there's this and there's this. I'm going to write all of this down. And you take it to the bottom and you give it to the people and it says like, do you know that there's a parade coming with 100 Dalmatians, dogs that's going to come. And people are like, no, this is crazy. I'm not seeing anything of this happening. So just wait. It'll happen. Because I saw it from a different perspective. Because I'm standing outside of the time limitations, your position demands of you to have an hour to see the whole thing. My position demands of me a split of a second to see the whole thing. You get that? The Bible is written by someone outside of our dimension of space-time. And it could look at the end from the beginning. That's why we have this, with this beautiful scripture in Isaiah 44, uh, 46 that says, I declare the end from the beginning. Why? Because God's view is different. Alright? And so, God wants to dwell with us forever. And that is what the Feast of Tabernacles is about. It's our, us celebrating what is to come when we are with Him for eternity. And that's what we're celebrating. And that's why God says, in this time, rejoice. Because you're not rejoicing because of your circumstances now. You're rejoicing because you believe God for the bigger picture. And what is that? He is going to take us out of this world into the promised land to be with Him. So that He can be with us forever and we can be with Him forever. Because God, right from the beginning, when we look at the first five books, it's all about relationship. God gave them His instructions. He showed them His ways. He started right from the beginning, Bereshit, 
to reveal to the people his purposes and plans. And that is that I'm a covenant God that wants relationship with my creation. And I'm going to show you how I'm going to do that for eternity. Let me give you a small prophetic picture. Hebrews, come. Moses, lead them. I'll pour out my plagues and judgment on everything that keeps you back. I'm going to take you to the promised land. There you are. Okay. The pattern has been established. Now, let's begin to work on the bigger thing. And there's going to come a day when Jesus, as the greater Moses, will lead us to the promised land. And it will be preceded exactly like with Moses. With the pouring of plagues and judgments. Last thought. How many people demonstrated the power of God to Pharaoh and the magicians? It was Moses and Aaron. Two witnesses. Alright? So two witnesses released the plagues of God and judgment and the shown of power against the gods of Egypt. What do you see in the book of Revelation before Jesus returned? Two witnesses. Doing what? The plagues of God against the Antichrist and the false prophet. Come on. You want to tell me that over 1,600 years that the Bible was written by over 40 different authors, some of them fishermen, some of them kings, some of them priests, some of them prophets, some of them just ordinary people, one of them a, uh, um, a doctor, a Greek guy called Luke. Do you want to tell me that all of them over 1,500 year period pinned all these data points exactly correct? That's not possible. It's not possible. Because we serve a God that's outside of space-time.